We are dealing with father wounds, and I'm um, not sure if we're live yet, but we are. Yes, we are. So good evening to everyone that's joining us on our platforms. I'm not sure exactly all of them that we are live on, but I'm thinking it'll be Facebook and YouTube. Okay, and we'll stay with those two. That's all I know right now. So thank you so much for being with us. Uh, tonight, this is Harvest Church coming to you live from the Cayman Islands, and so we are blessed. Um, you guys are coming in a bit late, um, but so we've already prayed and everything else, so we're going to just jump right into what we're dealing with tonight. Now, last week, and a, a few weeks actually, we were dealing with um, the inner man the carnal man, and we got a really good understanding of what, what we are dealing with, that part of us that is unregenerated, um, that part of us that doesn't want to be saved, right? <laughs> that part of us that love darkness, love to fight, love to do all these bad things. And, and you know, like the Apostle Paul, he also struggled with that inner man um, in Romans um, where he talked about the thing that I do, Romans 7, the thing that I do that I don't want to do, but I'm doing it. And the thing that I should be doing, that's the thing I do not practice. And he tells us that the things that we should be doing um, are things that we should be practicing. Um, they don't come natural, unfortunately. The bad things seem to come easier. But Paul is saying to us that the good things in life that we should be doing, the prayer, the fasting, the living good, um, holding our tongue and all these different things, those are the things that we actually need to practice. Sin, we just fall right into it. And we're like, whoa, how did I get here? I didn't even practice this, but I just fell right into it. But the good thing, the God thing, are those things that we should be practicing. So we dealt with um, the carnal mind and the carnal man and how it's um, hostile towards God. Um, and I told you that that is something that cannot be cast out because it's a part of us, but it can be and it should be subdued. Um, it should not be um, constantly out there doing whatever it wants to do because like Paul, we'd be saying the thing that I don't want to do is the thing that I'm doing. The thing that I should be doing is the thing that I'm not practicing. So we dealt with that. So tonight now, uh, we are still on that quest of understanding um, as we look at uh, the, we're looking at wounds, we're starting a, a, a time on wounds tonight. Um, and what are the wounds? We're talking about father wounds and mother wounds and the orphan spirit. And uh, we, we're going to dive into these areas. So Make sure you have a cup of water. Um, hopefully no one will be triggered as we get into this tonight. Um, and of course, these are not absolutes and these are not onlys. You know, these, these are not uh, the only things that we're looking at or that, that you will find. Um, but there's so much more involved with this. But tonight, we are starting tonight off talking about wounds and we're starting tonight talking about father wounds um, and father wounds we're not gonna mother's day is coming up so we're not gonna trigger anyone by talking about mother wounds <laughs> but we'll deal with fathers first and then we'll deal with everything else after that and so <clears throat> we have we have our, our persons here at church and you are live we're live with you, and so we may be using the microphone. So if you are in our social media congregation tonight, um, you may hear someone, but you may not see them. You might just see me, but you'll hear some other voice as we are dialoguing, okay? Um, that's how we like to do it here. So let's get going <clears throat> with this tonight. Um, as we talk about wounds... Um, and one of the things that is, that's very, very important tonight to, to know um, is that, you know, Satan himself was kicked out of heaven. And because of that, 
Um, he wants as many people as possible to join him um, in his anguish, okay? Satan himself is an orphan. Um, in comparison, he's an orphan when we compare everyone else in heaven, so to speak, and, and what he is, he's, all, he's out there all by himself, right? He has no family. The ones that he really want, he doesn't have them any longer. Um, of course, he has that third of the host of heaven, um, but um, I don't know if he really look at them as family. I don't even want to ask him. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to ask him either, but he has no real true family, you know, like, like how um, there was that, you know, the, the great witnesses and those that are shouting holy, holy, holy in heaven. Um, so a portion of his job, Satan's job, that is, is to create experiences and events with us humans where we feel like we have no family and we do not belong. So that's, that's, that's a portion of that assignment from, of the devil and of his, uh, his imps and demons to make us feel as though we have no family and that we do not belong. Um, he wants company. He wants us to join in with the way um, his whole being is. Um, he wants us to be isolated um, from God. Um, he doesn't want us to have that love for God and God to have that love for us. He, but he wants us to be orphans. He wants us to not have family. Um, so a part of the orphan spirit um, is connected to the father. And so we're talking about father wounds tonight because a part of the orphan spirit is connected to father wounds. Because you can't be, well, it's difficult to be an orphan um, with family, right? Um, you know, it's difficult. I mean, you, could, you, can, you can decide to, I forget what it's called. I know they're doing it or they've done it in the, in the, in the past in the United States. Um, I forget what it's called, where emancipation, that's what they're calling it over there, where children can be emancipated from their, from their parents, right? I don't want to deal with you anymore. I want my freedom. I'm emancipated. Yeah. Wow. Strange stuff. But, um, and that's not, that's not a normal occurrence. That's not what we really want. We want family. Uh, we want people to love and to protect us and to, to be there for us, people that we can share things with. But um, Satan's job is to pull us away from our family members. He wants to pull us away from uh, the people who love us. And he wants us to feel um, isolated and orphans. We must learn how to walk as sons and daughters of God. Right? Um, every once in a while we do get into that, we get into that, that space where we actually feel like orphans. Um, and it's not, it's nothing of of, um, it's not something that, that is thrown upon us, but sometimes we walk into it ourselves. Um, because of sin, um, we, we distance ourselves from God because we don't feel worthy. Adam did it, right? Adam um, did something that he should not have done. He ate of that fruit, and what did he do? He hid from God. Um, because he felt as though he was no longer worthy to, for, of God's presence. And, you know, that same trait is in us where there are times that we don't feel worthy of God's presence because of something that we did. And so the, 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 the carnal man in us tells us, don't pray because you are, it's hypocritical. You shouldn't be praying because you know that God is not going to hear you because you just did this, you did that, that, whatever. And so that carnal man would rise up and tell you, don't pray, don't read your Bible, don't go to church this week um, because you are a very bad person right now, right? Um, but we, we've learned how that, that those types of thoughts and those words that we don't listen to them at all, not at all, but we continue on 
um, in our fasting and our prayer. So what is the job of a father? Because Satan wants us not to be fathered, either earthly or spiritually heavenly, right? He wants us to be alienated from our father, our spiritual father, our heavenly father, as well as our earthly father. And because of so many plans that he puts in place over people um, that, that tend to be generational, right? Those plans, they are generational because um, three generations before you, you know, your great-great-great-grandfather may have done something or his father did something to him and now it, it's a trait. You know, he fathers children but never stay with them. And so um, Satan plants that seed in a generation. He plants that seed and then he just sits back and watch it grow. Um, but, you know, and, and so we, there's that war going on because now God is releasing his angels and his ministers and his evangelists and all kinds of people to war on our behalf to get those seeds up through prayer, through Bible study, through salvation. Um, now there's that battle, right? Satan planted the seed, the seed um, uh, three decades ago. Now you showed up. And God sent an evangelist and said, go down to that street. There's a boy over there. There's a girl over there. I want you to witness to them. And I want you to bring them into the kingdom. That's the war. Plant the seed way back when. God said, no, you're not going to get that one. Evangelist, go witness. Just drive. I'm going to send you to this street. You just drive. And I'll tell you when to stop. You stop. You find a bunch of kids. You start praying with them. You ask them if they know Jesus. They said no. You prayed with them, and now they became Christians. Kill that seed, right? So God won. And so this is why the church is so important, because um, there have been seeds that have been planted generations ago that God now wants us um, as his feet, his hands, and everything else. He wants us to now go and pull those seeds up, witness to people, talk to them, get them saved. Amen. So what is the job of a father? The father's job is to provide. The father's job is to protect. And the father's job is to give identity. I want you to go get a cup of water and make sure you don't get triggered tonight. Bring some tissue. Um, let it leave it right there and just join in tonight because we're going in. All right. We're going in. So what is the father's job? The father's job is to provide, to protect. And to give identity. All right? So, the Father's job is to provide, to protect, and to give identity. So, He provides for the family, right? He provides for the family, um, whether it's financial, emotional, physical, all of this is provision. And the Father provides for the family. Um, Psalm 34 and 10. The young lion lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Psalm 34 and 10. So the young lion, he lacks and he suffers hunger, but those who seek the Lord, um, why? Because God is a Father. So he provides. Those who seek the Lord shall lack shall not lack any good thing. Uh, Matthew 6 and 26. Look at the birds of the air. We know this one really well. Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father, your heavenly Father, feeds them because the Father's job is to provide. Your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they. And so God feeds the birds, um, the flowers with dew and all of these different things. You imagine that. Can you imagine those, those trees that are in the wilderness, desert, um, all these different places? They are being fed by God. The birds are being fed. Um, and so 
Aren't we even more than they as it relates to God? It's important for us to know that God is our Father. Amen? And so the Father's job is to provide. The Father's job is also to protect. Right? Right? Too many fathers have brought children into the world, um, protecting, them, protecting them from the curse of this world. Isn't that right? You know, so many, you know, so many fathers have brought children into this world and have just fed them to the world, allowed them to go into them to go into the world unprotected. And now they 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 cannot um, withstand the curse of this world. A lot, a lot, a lot of children um, tend to take on the same attributes of their fathers, you know, um, I remember my my eldest son, he he he, he was wow, he's a father now, right? He was trying so hard, trying so hard. He's looked at those some things that I did, and he was like, "Boy, Dad, we'll do that, right? Just right, just some basic things you do at home, how you you know you slippers and you dress and all that." And one day, a few months ago, he caught himself. And he texts me and say, oh, my goodness, I'm turning into you. <laughs> and I told him, I said, you, you don't have a choice. You are my seed, my seed. You are mini me. And so, and, and it's true, we, we tend to, to mimic, mimic our fathers, um, our mothers. Um, even our voices sound like them. Um, I sound like my brother's. And my brothers sound like my father. And so we, we, and it's just the way it is. I, I don't know why it's like that. I've been away from my father now for many, 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 many years. And there's certain things that I do. I'm like, hold on, that sounds so familiar. That don't sound like me. That sounds like him. You know, when did I start doing that? When did I see him do that, that I caught on to it, and now I'm doing it, you know? So there are things that, that fathers teach us, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. There are things that our fathers teach us that are, are very, very important for life, right? So fathers provide and fathers protect. Um, Psalm 32 and 7. Psalm 32 and 7. Th Psalm 32 and 7. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. Psalm 32 and 7. Fathers protect. Amen. Uh, the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. This is Psalm 34, 7 to 8. Oh, taste and see. This is the one, this part we know. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Fathers protect. And uh, it's important that, that we understand that fathers are to protect their household, their children. And like I mentioned, there's so many fathers that have dropped a child and just disappeared, right? And now that child has to deal with life the best way he or she knows how, right? Um, and even though we may have surrogates, um, there's nothing like that connection of blood. It's almost like even though the blood is on the inside of us, we stand next to a family member and we could sense them, we can feel them um, in a way that, that is, is like nothing before, right? So a father, we're talking about the wounds. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm building it, I'm building it, I'm building it. So a father's job is to provide. And a father's job is to protect. The third thing a father is to do, a father gives identity. And I think this is one of those lasting ones. This is probably the, for me, it's, it's the most important thing, I would believe, that the father gives identity. The father's role uh, is to give identity to his children. Children model what they see him do. Fathers who don't care have children who are careless, right? Fathers who don't care 
have children that are careless and selfish because they don't have those role models that they, that they should have um, in a father. And um, when you look at fathers and identity, um, think of what God had Adam doing. Adam was giving identity to everything that he had oversight over in the garden. He was calling a fish a fish. He was calling the birds birds. And so he was giving identity. A father's job is to reach into um, the future of a child and to give them their identity. This is why you have so many men uh, walking around and they're boys because they don't have identity. This is why you have girls who are actually women, but because they've not been given their identity, they're still trying to find it. Um, this is why they, someone, I guess, wrote that song that says, looking for love in all the wrong places. Y'all know it. Y'all church people know that one. <laughs> all right? Because a father's job is to give the identity that is so desperately needed in order to manage and conquer the world. And when you don't have that identity, it takes longer for us to know who we are in the world. Because now we have to try these different things. You know, we, because we're trying to figure out, who am I? Um, am I this person? You know, am I, am I a, a, a bully? So you try bullying for a season. You know, you walk around and you see someone in school, you know, you don't know who you are, and so a guy is drinking his, his, um, his soda, and you hit it out his hand, and you look at him and you laugh. I'm a bully, right? Um, and then you, you, you probably look at that and say, ah, I don't like doing that. That don't make me feel good, so I'm not going to be a bully next week. And so now you, you leave bullying, and you say, I'm going to be a football player, and so you start playing football, and you fell one time, um, bust your knee and you say, I, I don't think I'm a football player. I'm still trying to find my identity, right? Um, or now you get, you get in company with the bad boys who drink and smoke. And, you know, and I remember when I was a youth pastor, I told a group of guys this uh, because they were cursing. And I looked at them and I said, listen, man, you don't even say that right. You don't look good doing it. You don't look good saying it. Say it again. And he said it again. I'm like, that don't even sound good coming out of your mouth. You need to stop doing that because it don't look good on you. <laughs> right? Because some people force these types of things. Why? Because they're trying to find their identity. They don't look good cursing. I saw a young guy with a bottle of something in his hand. I'm like, come on, man. That don't even look good on you. You're not even holding it right. Throw that thing away. <laughs> throw it away huh? yeah some people they smoking and you're like ah come on it don't fit you it really don't right <clears throat> and these are people who are trying to find themselves you know um, the new craze now is vaping and you have all these young people with these you know they just they hold in this vape like they're supposed that's supposed to make them look cool I mean it just it's crazy. It doesn't look good. And so many of them don't look good doing it. Yeah. They're vaping and, you know, they just want you to see them puff that big thing of smoke and that, that, that gives them some street credit for a minute. That's all it is. Street cred. Right? And then um, when that goes away, they lose their identity. When vaping is no longer a craze, then you lose your identity. Right? Because you'll find... You, you, let me tell you how you know people that are trying to find out who they are and don't have an identity. They would spend the most money on something that they really don't need. Yeah? Um, and those are the ones that, that, that lack insight as to who they really are. Because they, they, will, they will buy the most expensive cell phone. Oh, let me leave that alone. They will buy the most expensive vape thing, vape thing, vape. They don't even want the pen because that's too cheap. They want the big old canister with the chrome and the, 
all these different things. And that, that, that means you really don't know who you are. You have an identity crisis. If you have to do that, you have to put your identity in uh, a vape canister, buy the most expensive one, or um, you wear name brand. Hey, listen, there's nothing wrong with name brand. But when you do not have an identity, you cannot get your identity from Gucci. Gucci put in the work. You didn't. You're wearing something that of someone that put in the work to get to, for their identity to be at a place where you want to wear their name, right? Um, but someone who knows who they are should never have to wear anyone's name to prove that they are somebody. Let me say that again. If you know who you are, you don't have to wear anyone's name to know and to become somebody, you don't have to wear a Gucci watch and a Gucci belt and a Gucci pin and Gucci glasses. My goodness, let's call you Mr. Gucci, right? And, and some people, way back in the day, there were guys who were called Gucci. Y'all had any guys who were called Gucci in, in, in where y'all were from, right? And, and everyone, you could, if, if you get on, on this live right now and say, do you know a Gucci in Trinidad? Someone will say, yes. Do you know a Gucci in Barbados? Someone will say, yeah. Oh, yeah, I remember Gucci in Barbados, right? You know a Gucci in the Bahamas? Yeah, there was a Gucci in the Bahamas. There was, the Bahamas has 700 islands. There's probably a Gucci on every island. A guy by the, who, they, who, who they call Gucci on every island, right? There was probably a Gucci in every province. That's what it's called? Province? In Jamaica. Parish. Right? There was probably a Gucci in every Paris in Jamaica. Or a Fendi. There's one here too. Okay. Gucci and Cayman. Forgive us. Right? But, but you know, and, and these are some of the things that happen. Right? Um, we, we need to have and we need our own identity. And we tend to not have that when we, when we are, when we have absentee fathers. Uh, when we don't have fathers that are around, then we have to go searching for identity. This is why so many young men, um, you know, governments all over the world, all over the Caribbean, they build parks with no supervision. So whenever you build a park and it's not supervised, it becomes a headquarters for a gang. All right? Whenever you build a park with no supervision, with no plan, with no um, programs for children and everything else, it becomes a hangout and a, and a headquarters for gangs. It's true. And so it's important that we understand, um, especially when our kids uh, start hanging out at the park, right? Uh, we need to be very, very careful with them because more than likely... If there's no supervision, um, then they are hanging out with friends who are giving them their identity. Yeah, um, especially young men. Um, they, they, they don't know who they are. Their father isn't around to tell them who they are, to say, you are a prince, you are a king. Um, listen, you're going to be an astronaut. You know, you are, this, I'm giving identity. Um, Daddy, I want to be... Uh, a scientist, man, listen, you can do that. Whatever you want to be, you can be. Just get those grades. And, and so now you're giving identity. You're giving um, credence. And you're sanctioning their destiny. As a priest, as a father, you are sanctioning, you are blessing um, your children. And so when we have children that did not go through that, um, then we have um, some neglect on our hands, right? Um, <clears throat> especially boys who have absentee fathers and really did not, were not caught in time, you will find that a lot of them, um, they go through rejection and rejection brings rebellion, right? This is why you'll find a lot of young men um, in prisons and all these, and all over the place because they, and you ask them, um, how did you get here? Where's your father? And they will say to you, 
Um, man, look, him, boy, I haven't seen him in years, right? Um, and if he come around me right now and they're going to say blanky, blank, 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 right? Because of fathers. And so we must understand that these father wounds are real. They are definitely, definitely real um, to so many people, right? They are real to so many people. Father wounds are real. Amen. And so we must, we must get that understanding <clears throat> that, that these things are real. And like I told you, some people might be triggered tonight, but we must talk about it, right? We must talk about it because these are some real things that people face the same way we looked at um, uh, the inner man, right? Um, that carnal side of us. We must look at these wounds, Right? We're going to talk about mother wounds and we're going to talk about the orphan spirit. We're going to look at these things. And these, these are, are topics that, that give you insight as to who we are and what we've been dealing with for such a long time. And so let's, let's keep going into it. All right. So Ephesians, someone find this and I know there are mics running around here somewhere. Um, Ephesians 2. Four to seven. If you find it, you can read it for me. Ephesians two, four to seven. <clears throat> Ephesians two, four to seven. You got a mic? All right. Thanks, Mom. But, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which, with which he loved us, mm -hmm. even when we are dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. <clears throat> By grace you have been saved and raised up together. And raised us up together mm -hmm. and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Wow. And so we see here that the love of God um, is all over us. You know, God loves us so much. He didn't leave us alone. Um, but God who is rich in mercy... Because of his great love, which he loved us. God loved us. Man, listen, if this doesn't excite you um, with this scripture, Ephesians 2, that God's um, mercy, he's rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. God has loved us with a great love. Um, he is passionate about us. He loves us. Um, God has not... And never will he um, neglect us. Um, he is always there. Actually, we neglect him most times, right? Many times we, we, we turn away, we turn aside from God. Um, but God loves us so much um, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Wow, that's coming, right? Some great things are coming. Um, and more, more kindness, more grace upon our lives um, because he is such a great and wonderful God. All right? Yes? No, you can. You, you just need to get, grab the mic so that our, our audience can hear you. All right. Um, this scripture that we just read, mm -hmm. this <clears throat> can be applied even... Um, this is a scripture that can be applied even if we don't, when we, when we don't have an earthly father, yes. right? But I realize that people have to grow into the understanding and the acceptance of God's love yeah. to us, yeah. right? Because it doesn't matter how we see it in the word with our eyes, but you have to grow into it and believe it, believe it. to really make it work. Yeah. 
in your life. So even if you don't have a physical father, then you yeah. can apply this and still feel loved. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Because I, I, I had my physical father, so I'm not, I don't think I experienced any mm. father wounds per se for myself. But to, I had to go into the understanding to know that God loves me. Yeah. Yeah, mm. even though when you were young, you grew up, Jesus loves me, this I, I know, know, but you yeah. still have to come into that yeah. within yourself to yeah. apply it. Yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's not as easy for some. Um, and like you say, they have to come into that, which means that it's a process, um, and you must decide that you're going to do that. I want to, f I want to experience God's love. You know, we almost have to say that. I want to experience God's love. I want to experience God's love towards me. Um, because our Christianity be can become very superficial, right? Where it's just routine. I'm going to church. I'm clapping. They taught me how to raise my hand and say hallelujah. So I'm doing that. And then I go home, but I still feel empty. Because I'm not experiencing my father's love, the love of God, right? Um, and, and so we, we must get to that place where we have that and we, we understand that um, and that we practice. Paul um, encourages us to practice the things that, that we want to see happen in our lives. And so if, if we, we want to see God's love and we want to experience his love, we've got to be there just like a physical love thing that we want, right? Um, think about when you um, fell in love with a particular person, a particular somebody. Man, you know, I remember when, when I was uh, a, a young chickadee and me and my, my now wife, you know, we were courting each other and I remember, you know, back in those days, we didn't have cell phones. We had to use a real phone with a cord and a rotary or a touch thing. You know, when, if you had a, 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 one of those pads in your house with the phone go beep, 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 beep. Man, you were saying something, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and so that's what we had. We had phones. You know, and so we had to, we were courting on the phone and, and I remember you kept that phone to your ear because sometimes they're talking so low, you know, and so you're trying to hear <clears throat> and that phone up to your ear for an hour. And so when it moves, you hear this <laughs> because of all the grease and that <laughs> you've been talking for a whole hour, right? And that was love. That was love. That was that love that, that, you, um, that you conjured up and that you, that you perfected, that you went after. Right? You didn't want that love to die. So you, you spent time on the phone um, to the point where you watched the sun come up and you're still on the phone. You didn't have to pay for the phone back then, you know. The sun just come up and you on the phone and then she, you saying, okay, good night, you hang up. And then she say, no, you hang up. And then, you know, no, you hang up. No, you hang up. Okay, we're going to hang up after three. One, two, three. Why are you still here? <laughs> right? And so that's, that's that love. And so we want to be to that place where we say, okay, God, I'm gone. And then you're still talking. Right? You're still talking to him. You know, you get up off your knees and you're still talking to him. You're washing the dishes. And you say, oh, God, I'm so sorry. I was supposed to be finished, right? But I just have so much. I'm not asking you for anything. I am not have this long laundry list of, Lord, give me a be beautiful car. Um, take these chickens out of my yard. Um, do this, do that. No, I'm just talking to him. And it's just like a love affair. And I know men sometimes, I'm coming to you, minister, Men sometimes have this challenge. You know, Elder Portia said it. Um, it's, a, it's an understanding that is not of this world, right? But as a man, the thing is, how can I love God? How can I say I love God? I'm a construction worker. I'm a big, brawny man. 
you know. I eat five meals a day. My muscles, when I put the tape around my muscles, is 30 inches. And you're trying to tell me, I must say, I'm in love with you, God? Men don't say that to another man. <laughs> right? And so these are the things. It's the truth. Right? And I believe that this is why, <clears throat> this is the fallacy. This is what, what keeps so many men out of the church. Because they've convinced themselves, maybe because they've been orphaned themselves, um, and they have no fathers, they have convinced themselves that um, church is a woman's thing. You know, because their mummies went to church, but they didn't see their daddies go to church. Their daddies went to the bar. Right? So, on Sundays, I go play football. Sorry, guys. I go play football, then I go sit down with, a, with, with my cooler open, and I go drink. Because that's what men do. Men don't go to church. Men don't lift their hands in worship. Men don't lead people into worship. Men don't lead people into prayer. Men don't leave, lead people into salvation. That's a woman's job. And that is the biggest misconception and illusion that the enemy has crafted over the male seed of this world. Minister Kevin. Coming back to you, Minister. Uh, yes, Pastor, you mentioned that uh, one, of the, one of the things that Fathers does is brings in, uh, uh, he creates identity. Mm -hmm. um, so what I wanted to do was, when I was looking at the scripture, um, the scripture in Ephesians, but what gave birth to the scripture was what happened in Genesis. So when we look at when God created Adam, mm -hmm. man in his own image and his own likeness, it was, so we're talking about the very, I did the physical, we talked the very makeup and the very identity of Adam to operate even as God in terms of also of his character, the identity and how he sees himself and how he approaches, makes decisions and all of that. So it's about the very identity, the very image of God that God wanted the earth because remember the word of God did say that with the earth his it was his will that the earth be filled with the with the knowledge of the glory, glory of, of God, God in the earth yeah. so everything that you see around you mm -hmm. speaks of the knowledge of the glory of God and so Adam given this great privilege he failed in this assignment he produced children but he didn't produce the image of god in the earth mm -hmm. and so where we see in now in the new testament the new covenant uh jesus came as the last adam uh to so that he could give birth to not physical children but to release spiritual children in the earth to release the identity the image of god so all that came and that died with christ mm -hmm. and as christ and they were born of the spirit they now could display the image of God in the earth. So we saw, and when we look at the word of God, God was about um, not so much of, his thing was about creating children, but his main assignment was mm. that the image of God fill the earth in everything. Yeah. And, um, and so, uh, and I'm glad you mentioned that the father also gives, he gives the child that spiritual identity because that's the very thing that God wants a family structure to do that is yeah. in Christ Jesus yeah. is to create whether it's spiritual sons and daughters, but the, 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 their children comes, is groomed and comes up in the name of the Lord. They come to know the Lord. They, they bear the glory of God, the image of God in their life. Yeah. 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 Good. Good, good. Something, Minister Oli? Yes, Pastor. I would like also to come back to uh, that point of fatherhood of God. Um, I noticed that uh, most, most, more often when you come to the struggle for a believer to accept God as a father, we, we tend mostly to focus on 
maybe those that have not had the chance, uh, the opportunity to have a father with them. I mean, a healthy father, a father around them where they grew up. Uh, what I would like to raise to um, point is that um, the fatherhood of God is is understood by revelation, regardless of whether you have you had a, he- a he- healthy father mm-hmm. or you, you did not have it. You have nothing to do with that. Um, as you mentioned, Father uh, uh, Pastor. You, you can even see men that had father, but they still have that misconception that you mentioned earlier. Yeah. That men doesn't raise them to the ch- in church. Right. Church is the thing of women. Right. Those kind of things. And yet they have fathers. Mm-hmm. So sometimes um, it happens also. So sometimes it may happen that you feel that you are well positioned to receive God's love just because you... You, you are being raised with the father and yet you are actually deceiving yourself. Yeah. You, you do not go from a point of revelation because uh, as you grow, just like a child, from the childhood until an adult, you can see your father downfall. You can see your limitation. Mm-hmm. And when you come to God, if you don't have revelation, you will also put God in a box. Yeah. In a box that looks like your father that you know. Right. So there are something that coming from God you cannot receive it because your mind is not renewed, and you are not better in any way than somebody who did not has a father mm-hmm. and then struggle to receive God's love. Because by the end of the day, either way you need to receive God's love through revelation and understanding. Yeah, to go beyond your limit and to really receive God actually, mm-hmm. and you will see a child like a little child. Um, you may he may ask he may ask you for uh, I, I don't know he, he may ask you for a pen today mm-hmm. you say you 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 refuse to him but tomorrow you come to ask you even for for a bike but when you grow up with the same father when he refuses you maybe a bike a bike you never go for him for a car. Right. Because you remember that he, he, he refused you a bike. But now, when Jesus said, renew your mind, be like child, it means what, whatever you have learned as limitation of your father, when you come to God, you become like a child. Mm-hmm. So you will not get upset when today you ask something to God. He said no, to ask to go a bigger thing because you, you still open up like a child. You come to the point of revelation that if God had have, have denied you something today, tomorrow he can, he can give you even something that is bigger because you are not you are just like a child. Yeah. So your mind is completely renewed and you have deep revelation. So the, your, your father figure that you have, that you know, does not give you the full picture of God. Yeah. You, you completely make the difference between the two of them completely different and that also help those who even have a father but the father the father disappoint them Mm -hmm. that also help them when they come when we all come to them to that very place of understanding and revelation regardless your background yeah 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 that that one is nice and deep um because it and it is true i'll just paraphrase just a little snippet of it um we must have revelation of god um to understand who he is, because without the revelation, um, we will be looking at God in the through our physical eyes, right? Um, our physical fathers, we go to them for a bike, money for prom, a car, and those types of things. And if we only see God like that, then we'll be going to him for a house, a wife, a husband, right a uh, piece of property um and whatever you know and so now we look at god as god i'm coming to you because i need your father right that's what a father is for right to give it to me now give me everything i need um and you know then we could talk more and sometimes and i said to you so many times that there are many times that we as believers we act like terrorists towards God. You know, we hold 
ourselves hostage and we tell God, I am not going any further until you give me what I want. You know, this car, you need me to go to church and sing, but you got to give me a better car. I can't make it to church until you give me a better car. You know, so now we hold God hostage and we're terrorizing him because we, we, we're still using that carnal mindset to say that God is like earthly fathers and mothers and I could terrorize him like I terrorize them. And we can't do that because we must look at him through spiritual eyes and get an understanding of how big he is. Um, and that, that, yeah, that, that really works. And I'm, I'm loving that. All right. So father wounds. Um, father wound. The father wound does not come because your father died. Okay. Let's, let's make that clear. Father wounds don't come because your father died. But if the father fell short uh, in the area of providing, protecting, and giving identity, that can help to create a wound because it's a it's a chasm it's it's a gulf it's something that that is open and it, you know the father did not um, uh, give you enough in those particular areas you know especially identity you know that people that that say you know their father said to them you know I'm going to meet you at the the, the gate to bring your money for school, for your lunch. You know, you may be a female and you say, okay, daddy, I'm going to be at the gate waiting for you. You're, young, you're a young girl then. And so you went, he said, meet me, I'll be there at 12 o'clock, sharp. And so you ran to the gate because you have never been disappointed by your father before. And so now you show up at the gate. And he is not there, right? And you wait for 30 minutes and he never show up. And so you left, right? You didn't think anything of it because nothing there yet. But let him do that three times. Um, and then what, have you, what would you now say about your father? I can't depend on him, Right? And then sometimes what we do because of the disappointment, um, we, we tend to allow that seed to grow into a thing where we, we categorize all men like your father. Right? Um, and what happens when we, if that happens enough time, right? Your father disappoints you. And then you you have a late class now. You're in eleventh year and twelve, and you got was it CXCs? Yeah, right. Um, and so now, your brother, you said to him, "You have to meet me." You know, I'm getting out of class at five o'clock. It's going to be dark, and I have to walk by myself. I'm going to be there. 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 And you get out of class. And you have to walk home by yourself. Right? And so now, you say that your father disappointed you. You're walking home. Fear begins to creep in. You have to walk through a bunch of guys. You're terrified. They don't bother you, but it's the dog that bite you. So now you're saying, I can't believe this. You know, who can I depend on? I can't depend on them. Right? So now you are forming um, what, what your opinion is of not just your father and your brother, but of men. Right? And so now you become an independent woman. Because you can't depend on men. Your father showed you that. Your brother showed you that. And so rather than you get hurt in your adult age, you've decided that I am going to work this thing for myself. I'm going to get married, but you're going to meet me with my own stuff. Right? Um, and so now we have these things happening in our lives. Right? That, that's a little bit off balance. A little bit off balance because now 
we actually are wound real tight for protection. I'm not letting you in. I can't let you in. I can't. I, I let people in before and they hurt me. So I am not letting you into my heart. So you lock that heart right up. Cold as ice. Right? Um, but, that, you know, yeah, okay, everybody take a deep breath. Let's, let's, let's come back. Okay. So um, the wound is an inner wound issue. It's inside. I told you all it's going to get a little icy and, right, don't get triggered, right? Um, but the wound is an inner healing issue. When we have wounds and father wounds and mother wounds, it's an inner healing issue. Um, they are infections, if I could call it that, of the soul. Yeah? I could use that? Yeah. They are infections of the soul because um, it's, it's not on the outside. It's not on the outside at all, even though you may have some feelings, you may shed some tears, but it's all the way on the inside. It's a soul issue. You know, I've been disappointed by father, I've been disappointed by brother, right? Um, or you may be a son and, and, you know, your daddy promised you all the time, I'm coming to your game, son. And he always just have an excuse, right? Oh, no, I couldn't get off work. So how come I saw you by the bar? No, 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 but the boss sent me out to just get some stuff. Um, that go back to work, you know, and so these are those types of things that even with men, right, when our fathers um, are not there, you know, especially boys, they start off with a good appointment, and then when fathers start letting them down, they become disappointed, they move away from their appointed destiny, and they start going in an area to try to heal that wound. They start looking for friends and looking for people to, to, um, um, to speak into them, to fill that void, you know. Um, so they join these groups and gangs and teams and all these different things. And, and they're hoping that someone could fill that big void that they have on the inside of them, right. Um, but, you know, we said it, only God can do that. When your father and mother forsake you, the Lord will lift you up. And, and that's a serious thing, you know. Um, and, and it's real. It is real. But lots of times we don't, we don't gravitate to God when father and mother forsake us. Right? We go to our default. And our default is normally a thing of the world. Why? Because our inner man... Um, drives us down to that default, which takes us even further, right? Because it's, if we've spent all this time in the flesh, it's difficult when you are disappointed and rejected. It's very difficult to get on your knees and say, okay, God, take me as your child. You know, we talked about all of this um, tonight. Sometimes it's very difficult, oh, God, take me as your child. And so all of the stories are playing over in your mind. You know, daddy wasn't there. You know, he neglected me. He disappointed me. He lied to me. He lied to me. He lied to me. And so you're trying to wade, wade through all of that disappointment waters of your earthly father to understand how deep is the love of my heavenly father. And so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process. And not many people, unfortunately, make it through the process. Um, and it's a sad thing, right? But not many make it through the process because the wounds of their father is just so great. Now, I would say that with some help and some guidance, you can actually make it through, right? But lots of times we want to do these things ourselves, right? Um, because that's another aspect of father wounds, and we're going to get into that. Um, give me another 10 minutes, and then I'll be done for tonight, right? And so um, these, these wounds are inner 
healing issues, right? Um, these aren't stuff that we wear on the outside. This is why we cry at night. This is why we think about it, think about it, think about it. This is why when we see our father picture, we get triggered, right? Because we're like, hold on. I don't, why am I seeing his picture? Why am I feeling this way? I shouldn't feel this way. But you have no control over it. It's like I'm, I just get, um, I freeze when I see him or his picture. I don't know how I should feel. I don't know how I should think. I don't know if I should smile. I don't know if I should say hi. I don't know what to do because of the lack of respect that he showed me when I was a child. All right? So let's go. So not, um, this isn't something, <laughs> a father wound is not something that I personally believe that you can be delivered from, right? Because it's an attitude of the heart. It's something that, that, that is on the inside. That's that will and that emotion. It's actually something that you actually have to say, God, take me up. Yeah? yeah? Take me up. Yeah. Because if I just constantly think about this man and what he's done to me, I'm going to go nuts. I'm going to go crazy. So God, take me up. I don't want to die, but take me up into your arms and show me what it is to have the love of a father. Right? And Elder Portia said that this is something that isn't, I mean, it's easy for us to talk about, but it's something that really we have to really work on. We have to practice it. And you really have to go, go into it in order for it to happen. Okay, let's just keep going. Give me five more minutes and then I'll be done. People deal with father wounds if, number one, father was negligent in your life. If your father was negligent in your life, you would probably have to deal with a father wound. And people, um, you know, this, this isn't something that we could say, you know, don't, don't feel if you know you, you have to deal with this or you've dealt with it or you're dealing with it, it's not something that we need to hide away from. It's just life. You know, this is just the reality. The world is in a mess. You know, you may not have known your father. Your father may not have known his father. And that's just the way it is. Unfortunately, no one asks for that. None of us asks for that. Nobody asks for that. It just so happens that the enemy has just crafted this thing. That's the weapon that was forged against you and your generation and your family. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. You didn't do anything to have your daddy around. It just happened, you know. It just... It just what happens, right? And some, some, some have it, some didn't have it. And that's just the way it is. But um, we must, when we become matured, um, we must get that understanding, you know, that we still have, we have God as our father. Yeah? All right. So um, people who deal with father wounds, number one, father was negligent. You know, father was not there. Yeah, I'm going to be there. I'm going to come um, bring you that lunch money. Never showed up. You needed that book. Um, to turn in your homework, and they said, I'm bringing the book. Don't worry, you can trust me. And you needed that grade to get that A. And you, have, and you told daddy that, daddy, listen, this is, because you know him, right? You know him. So you have to spell it way out. Even as a young girl, you have already um, um, adopted that understanding that you have to spell things, you have to carry your daddy, you have to carry your brother. As a young girl, you already have that mindset that these guys are idiots. <laughs> you don't say it because you're a nice girl. You don't say it, but you, you, you realize I got to spell it out for you because you're, you just, you, you, you out there. You way out there, right? You're special. <laughs> All right. Daddy, I really need that book. It's right on my bureau. Um, it's purple. It has flowers on it. Um, uh, and I really need the book. Don't worry about it. I'm going to bring it. I'm going to bring it. You never see the book. Right? And so all of this stuff builds up, builds up, builds up. You know, that's a form of being negligent. 
right? Um, when they promise, but they never deliver. You go hungry at school. You now develop all these headaches and different things, and you just say, listen, man, I, I can't depend on you, right? Negligent, right? You, d you develop um, father wounds if father left abruptly. He's just, he's just, he pulled himself out of your life. Abrupt. That's a shock. You know, parents don't understand how and what children go through um, through separation. Right? We parents become so selfish. Right? Um, you have three kids, two kids, whatever, and you you're fighting all the time in front of them. Selfish. Right? And now you want to know why your children are on antidepressants? Because they, they, are, they are anxious. You know, kids don't understand what the shouting means. You know you're not going to hurt anyone. And you're, but they don't understand that they're little kids. They're babies. So you shouting and you shouting. You cursing in front of them. You're both of you. That's like their world has just been torn apart. So they get depressed. They get anxious, they develop asthma, they develop, they can't sleep, um, they can't eat. And so now you have a child that is going to grow into an adult that have all of these types of issues. Why? Because of your selfishness. My goodness. And then, on top of that, when they start getting bad grades in school, you blame them. And they don't have the language to tell you, this is your fault. <laughs> I am this way because of you. I could hear you in the night. I'm trying to sleep. I put the covers over my head. I put the pillow over my head. And you all just keep fighting every night, every night. Now my hands are shaking. Right? And so now these selfish parents... And then after all of that, you damage that child. And then, Father, you decide, I'm gone. Oh, man, you could feel that. Hey, that, that is such a bad thing. You damage the children, and then you pick up and you leave them. And now they get damaged even more. Because now um, you abruptly left. So now they are abandoned. Some of the children, depending on their personalities, will feel as though it's their fault, mm -hmm. right? This is why some of them, you know, try to hurt themselves. They start cutting because it's the pain. They have this pain and they can't get rid of this pain. And so when I cut, it, it feels like it releases. That's why they cut, lots of them, you know. And these kids, they, didn't, they weren't born damaged. Like you said, they didn't ask to be here, right? They weren't born damaged, but now because of us as parents who are now so selfish, I want it my way. They're damaged. And then you turn around and leave them damaged. And then you want to show back up in their lives after they try to pick up the pieces when they're an adult and you want to show back up, not change, you're still a kid, right? You say you're a man, but you're still a boy because you never really come and say, listen, I'm sorry, let me admit to this. I should not have left the way I did. I should not have said, you didn't say anything. And they're waiting, right? So fathers who um, left ab abruptly, we can... Um, have these wounds, right? Um, fathers who didn't show love or any form of connection, right? Um, you know, I'm sure everyone remembers or knows about that study that they said was done um, many years ago. I think they only did it once. They never did it again. Where those babies, some babies were, were cuddled and picked up and some were just left in the crib, right? Um, and those that were, were handled and felt that, that hard beating 
um, they survived and those that didn't um, get that attention and affection. Um, I think they said some of them died or whatever, and uh, so they decided we're not doing this study again, right? Um, or I'm, I'm sure you, I don't know if you heard this one where um, twins or two boys were asked. Um, one became, one, their father was a drunkard. One became a drunkard and the other one became a very, went to college and became very successful. They were asked, why and what happened to you? The one that became a drunkard said, I saw my father drunk and I couldn't help myself, so I became a drunkard. The other one said, I saw my father drunk and I decided I didn't want to be that. So I went the opposite way. Right? And so these are some of the things that happen in a home. Um, there are some kids that will make it. Um, they'll persevere. They just build different. When a father is gone, um, they, will <clears throat> they will find themselves still going on. And they will make it. Others will crash because they just needed more attention than ever. Right? Um, and so this, this is just some of those things that happen. Give me, let, me, let me just say one more, one more thing, one more thing. Fruit of the father wound. Now, I hope this is helping somebody. Yeah, you're getting some information and getting some understanding. Good, good, good. People who have father wounds, um, some of them are very independent, right? Um, and they, they seem to be go-getters, <laughs> right? And they, they are very, very independent. They don't like um, compliments, um, and they don't like getting any help. They want to do it themselves, right? Um, people who have father wounds can be very, very independent. They don't like to be corrected by anyone, right? And the reason for that is that it triggers them, you know? Um, some persons, and this, this, this is not... I'm not, this is not a blanket statement. I can't, this is not blanket, right? Um, and some people are triggered when a male tells them what to do because of the wound of their father, right? Don't tell me, it, that's what they're saying on the Instagram, don't tell me what to do. Dot, dot, dot. My daddy wasn't there, Right? And if he ever tried to tell me what to do, I'll give him a piece of my mind. And so now everyone gets painted with the same brush. You know, you're a male and you saying, why, why is, what, what's going on? But they're just being triggered because of the offense of their father, right? Um, they're boys who, you know, and I, I witnessed this myself, a coach was, you know, just trying to get the guys, young boys, um, to do the drills, right? And one of them just, he just got triggered. He said, don't you tell me what to do, right? Why are you shouting at me? And coach is like, you all the way down there, what you want me to do? Speak soft, right? Don't shout at me, right? And it's, it's all because we get triggered, um, when father isn't there, we don't know how to react to that voice of a male sometimes, right? Um, because we don't hear it a lot. Mummy gave all the orders. And so now, he, where, who are you? No man has ever told me what to do. And you come in now, try to tell me what to do? Uh-uh. You're not doing it, Right? <laughs> and so, and so these, are, these are some of the things that happen, right? Um, and, and I'm trying to just open your eyes to some, these are just some realities. And sometimes we deal with it for such a long time and we don't know. We don't know what's going on on the inside of us, right? Um, they, people who are father wound, some of them don't like to be corrected, right? Um, if they could get away with it, um, they would wear a sign on it that says, caution, don't work well with others, right? Um, if they could get away with it, right? And so, 
Um, these are some of the real deal issues, right? Don't tell me what to do. But you can't, you can, you don't, you don't have the language to say why you saying this. What's triggering you with me saying, um, hey, why don't you pick that up? Don't you tell me what to do? But we don't have the language for it. Come on, boys, go faster. Don't shout at me. Right? Because they don't, they, they, they don't have that voice. Right? This is why um, the children of Israel, they said to Moses, you go talk to God. When we hear his voice, it sounds like thunder. And Moses probably said, really? It sounds like God to me. Why? Y'all tell me why. Relationship. They didn't have relationship. Right? And so um, a father's voice will sound off when you don't have relationship. God's voice will sound like wrath and thunder and condemnation. If, you, if there's no relationship. But he's a good father. But if we are out of relationship, we can't pray. We don't want to read our Bibles. We don't want to go to church. Because God, we now move ourselves away from a son or a daughter. We now put ourselves in an orphan category. Right? I told you all this story before. Orphans, me and you could go. Y'all could come to my house. My dad is on. I think he's still here. Y'all could go, to, go with me to the Bahamas and we pull up to my father's house and I open the door and I walk in. Who can walk in behind me? Nobody. Right. See, that, that, they say nobody. Right. Um, and so you have to be invited in. Why? Because you are a guest. Most times when we move ourselves out of sonship, we put ourselves as an orphan. Right. And, and so this is why even our prayers change. We don't boldly come to the throne of grace. We stand on the outside saying, God, um, it's me. Yeah, I wonder if you could just, I wonder if you could just do something for me this one time. I'm not going to ask you again. That's an orphan. That's not a son or a daughter, Right? A son or a daughter will throw their face on the ground and say, Daddy, help! This thing going wrong. God, if you don't help me, I don't know what I'm going to do. I only have you. Yeah? And so this is so important and this is where we are. Um, we must understand our position in God. You know, we are sons and daughters. Um, we are not orphans. Um, and so many times we would have that feeling as though we are fatherless because we, we equate being um, God, we, we, we liken God to our earthly father who disappointed us, left us, do whatever, whatever, whatever. And we, we figure that God is going to do the same thing. That's, maybe that's why he's taking so long to answer my prayer. Right? Maybe I'm not good enough. You see, now we, that, that old man, is rising up and telling you, you're not good enough for God. He likes Minister Kevin more than he likes you. You have to pray like him. You have to read your Bible more. Um, you have to show up to church all the time. Um, and so these are the things that God wants you to be. And until you do that, don't go to God because he's not going to listen to you. That's not true. Right? Don't ever believe what your inner man is telling you. <laughs> He's a liar, right? But, but these are just some of the points, and I'm going to let us get out of here. You have something you want to say? Or nobody? Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone? Okay, good. You, have, you do. You got to use the mic, though. Yeah, uh, again, about those two kids that, for the same reason, became something different. Yeah, those kids. Yeah, those kids that because their father was a drunker, mm -hmm. one become a drunker as well, yeah. and the other one become a successful whatever. Yeah. But if you, if you look again, you go deeper to both of them, the one that apparently appeared to be successful 
or the one that appeared to have failed, you will notice that you may notice that when you go to the one who become a drunker, mm -hmm. he will be easy to engage with in a relationship to talk openly or maybe to be around. But if you go to the one that succeed mm -hmm. somehow for the same reason, it might be somebody you cannot relate with. Yeah. Because That's by the true. end of the day, they still, he's still holding a pain mm -hmm. inside of him. And you may see... You may, that you is could, very good. Yeah, some people you are seeing do things that look good, yeah. but from a, from a wrong motive deeply. They, go, they do it from a place of frustration because they have learned to take their frustration to, to close it, to look, to look really good. Mm -hmm. you, will somebody, you will see somebody... For example, when somebody is hurt, mm -hmm. you can see somebody wake up early in the morning, start cleaning the house, making everything in order, mm -hmm. you may think that that person is doing it because he's so job for no, no. When you come closer and try to pierce it, to, 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 to look to it, you, you understand that person is actually bro a broken person. Yeah. And that person tried to cover up or maybe to cover the, the pain and doing yeah. those kind of things. Sometimes when I observe people doing certain things in certain way, I question sometimes, it happens to me to question sometimes, does that person doing that for me uh, I would not say bad motive for for a from a good point, or he's just doing it because he struggled with something that is hurting him from inside. Yeah. Be, uh, before he do, uh, 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 so he doing that thing from that place. So we need to really discern. Sometimes when we see people acting in a certain way, do certain yeah. things, it, it can reveal a lot of things, even though the things look look nice to our yeah. eyes. Yeah. That's true. That's true. That's, that's some good wisdom right there. Um, my next point, last one for the night. People who struggle with father wounds, some um, will be workaholics, to your point. Some will be workaholics or high achievers. That's what you're looking for right there, right? Um, so their identity comes out of performance, right? Performance-driven identity. Their identity comes out of performance because, remember, their father wasn't there. They are still looking for the affirmations. They're still looking for the applause. They're still looking for someone to say, you did it, man. You did it, right? And so they, they become workaholics. The more I work, the more praise I may get. Um, I'm working for the praise, and they just keep going they, because the more they get, it's just not good enough. And you can never satisfy that, that hunger for a father's approval. You can't satisfy that hunger for earthly father's approval. But we try, right? And so they're, they're, they're high performers. They're workaholics. Um, their identity comes from hearing compliments of others. But after a while, it's like a drug, Right? Because you, you start getting it, but after a while, it's just not good enough. Yeah? Because the void isn't being filled. You know? You get a little good high one time. You get your accolades. You get your employee of the month. Right? Um, but after a while, everyone else start getting it. And so now you're not on that level where everyone else is below you. So now you're thinking, how can I get up there where no one else is? I don't want to share this limelight with nobody, right? So their identity comes from hearing people applaud them and compliment them. Um, they, some, some persons who are father wounds can also be people pleasers, right? Um, placators, so to speak. You know, they, they are constantly, constantly um, trying to find out, um, did I do a good job? Can I do something for you? Um, because you need someone to tell you, you know, you, you have this big void that you need filled with, you did a good job. I'm so happy. Um, you are the best. You know, you just need that. Yeah, yeah, you need it. I... I, I and the more you get, the more you need, and it's never enough. Because what you're trying to fill is a void that has been left by your father. And your father could step in one day and fill it. 
if he really meant it. He could come back into your life and say, listen, I'm, I'm really sorry. I apologize for all of the hurt I caused you. Woof, gone. All those years of working hard and getting home three o'clock in the morning from work and, and um, employee of the month, employee of the month, employee, employee. You know, you've been the only employee of the month for 12 months. <laughs> And your father could come there and you decide after that, I don't need to be employee of the month anymore. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm done. Right? Um, if nobody noticed the job that you did, um, uh, and if nobody talks about it, it can irritate that person. And we get it in church. Right? Not this church. But we get it in churches. Right? Um, they stay up late, they stay late, they, they come early and do all these different things. And if, uh, not here, but if you don't tell them from the pulpit and on the stage and on the screens and everywhere else and on the, um, the chat group, so-and-so came early and stapled 5,000 papers for the Easter program. Let's give them a hand. You see all these virtual hands start clapping. And if you don't get that, you start putting in the word out. Pastor did not. Did he? Did you tell him I was there till five o'clock in the morning? Yes, I did. So why didn't he say anything? I don't know. You know what? I'm not coming back here. Yeah. I didn't get it. Yeah. I'm not, and then you, you, you get up in the volunteers meeting and you say, I have something to say. This has been burning on me for a very long time. Five years ago, I was at the church until three o'clock in the morning, stapling all those papers, and I never got not even a thank you. And you're talking to people who wasn't here five years ago, and they're like... <laughs> Okay, we didn't know anything about that, right? But then we hold those things, right? We hold them, we hold them, we hold them. But okay, all right, I'm gonna, we, we're going to end here. Um, we're going to end here tonight. Um, but it's, it's been a good night um, as we just break open wounds. Um, a few years ago, I did something called ice in my veins. Y'all remember that? And so we, we're just taking little excerpts. We're taking little excerpts from from those years and just refreshing and making it fresh um, because these are things that we can't say it once in five years and never go back to it because, you know, like all these people here, some of them saying, I don't know anything about that. Yeah, because y'all were still in your mother's womb. <laughs> just get Okay, um, two, two persons and then we, we can end it up. I was thinking the same thing. I was like, we did this already, but it's still good. That's what I was saying in mm -hmm. my mind to go back. Yeah. But um, one thing that can help anyone get over any kind of wounds at all is forgiveness. Yes. Right, because what you said there about the father can come back in that day and and um, make amends. Yeah, the strength. Right. Mm -hmm. But that that will have, and that's true. But that will have to do with me as the daughter yeah. forgiving, forgiving him so th that's the key in, in all of this you know because even if if the father has passed or the father is never to come yeah. back you what know you, you have it? to yeah so forgiveness is is key to overcoming yeah. all of this yeah very good thank you very much for that yeah that's a good um, yeah, i wanted to mention that um pastor all that you had mentioned uh, you know, it, it's it's really educating us to let us know that, hey, that even when I think, because my mindset is on the ministry in terms of when Harvest began to expand and most of us began to move into greater influence of ministry and leadership here, uh, we're going to be taking on, as the Harvest comes into the church, these are the kind of people that we're going to be dealing with, uh, broken lives. Mm -hmm. um, I know some, some, we can't be prepared to think we're dealing with people who have all together, right. we're going to be dealing with some really rough cases and we're going to have to 
make sure that our love is going to really be so sound in God because when we begin to mentor and mothers, uh, uh, women begin to now mentor the other women and you begin to see people agitated in your area of ministry, mm -hmm. you're really going to have to now shine that image of God on them because we're dealing with people. We're dealing with broken people yeah. and not perfect people. So I think what it will do, it will deliver us from the place of maybe complaining with maybe our neighbors and with people that yeah. God has not placed in our care to really say, God, okay, Lord, this is now a place like what Elder Portia said, of how do we now, the place now, um, and to be able to relay that forgiveness in this working environment in terms of the church, yeah. you know, because we're really going to deal, we're going to face it. We're going to really may deal with some strong personalities that may come into the ministry, yeah. you know, so be prepared for it, people. Yeah. Be prepared for the unlovable. Be prepared for uh, people that really oh, yeah. may try to really shake us, you know, but we, this is where God is calling us to be, to, to deal with the dirty people. And I say dirty, I mean in terms of the brokenness and the yeah. wombs and to really love on people. So yeah. it's it's really, it you know, and I, I really believe this is, um, what we're getting is to give us a sense of understanding, um, you know, and for what we are about to really uh, partake of. Because when I think of Jesus, Jesus dealt with a lot of disciples that had a lot of issues, yeah. you know, and, uh, and he was able to know how to just individually deal with, uh, with them, mm -hmm. and so it it just tells me something that we'll be about to walk in because as the ministry grow, you can have more. You have really with different personalities that will come in. You're not Correct. just dealing with yeah. uh, persons that we are familiar with, right? Um, but uh, we're really going to have to. Yeah, it's going to be some work. Yeah, spiritual work. <laughs> and you, and you have to make sure that you that you um, are in a good place because if you are doing ministry to someone and they trigger you, you know, they start telling you about, oh, my daddy did this and my dad. And now you get lost because now you start tuning into what your daddy did because you never forgave him. Right. Um, and so now you're like, um, let me get someone else to talk to you. Now you got to go talk to somebody. Right. Because you're carrying, you've been carrying all of this. And this is one of the reasons why we're doing this. So that we can get free from some things that we um, didn't think of before. Right? A lot of these hurts that we've, we've locked away in a, in a chest. And we dug a hole and we put those in the ground. Um, and somehow, you know, this is the Caribbean and when we have water... Um, things start floating up out the out the ground. <laughs> Somehow, um, you you have a flood of emotions, right? And those things that were hidden start floating up, and you're like, "Where did this box come from?" And now the the thing opened wide, and now all of those things that you have locked away come back in front of you, and now you are just traumatize all over again and you, you you know so we must we must deal with these things um, and um, we we must spend time with our Heavenly Father right build relationship with him um, real relationship not built on um, what I could do for you um, and then you'll do for me right if I fast for you then, you know, that's what we say, fast for him. God, I'm fasting for you. So if I'm fasting for you, you need to give me that loan to the bank, right? Um, but no, we're fasting for spiritual clarity. We're fasting for spiritual strength. We're not fasting for God. God don't need you to fast for him, right? He was God before you even showed up, right? He don't need your help, right? Um, and so these are some of the things that we actually need to go through and, and work on um, because we could be a super spiritual Christian and we have all kinds of stuff that we've not dealt with and then we can't go anywhere. Yeah, so we could shout, we could speak in five tongues um, and still someone come to you and say, I was molested and you don't know, you just get triggered 
because you never dealt with it. Right? Someone says, I've been stabbed. And you never told anyone that you got stabbed. Nobody knows. Right? And so someone comes and says, I was homeless. Nobody knows you were ever homeless. And you can't talk to them anymore, right? Because if you open your mouth, you may reveal yourself. And you don't want to do that because now you're triggered. You know, you tra re traumatize. So now you have to pass them on to someone else because the more they speak, the more you want to tell them, I was just like you. I was there too. But now you're driving a Benz, you know, and you got red bottom shoes. Or for a guy, you're wearing a. They don't wear three button suits anymore, right? You got a one button suit. They don't do three no more. They ran down to one. A two piece. Right? Yeah. Two piece biscuit and thigh suit. <laughs> right? And so now you have all of this stuff going on. And so you don't want anyone to know where you've come from and how God has blessed you because you think it's bad to know that I came from the bottom and I worked my way through God's grace to the top. And so it's a blessing that we can be here. We can go through these types of things. Um, we can talk about them um, and we can grow from them, you know. And we realize that God is our Father um, who is rich in mercy because of his great love which he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses, that's right. Even though we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. So even though we did all kind of bad things, God says, no, you're my child. Amen, amen, amen. And so, Father, tonight we thank you for your love that even when we were dead, we were numb with all of the challenges that life brought to us you still found us and brought us to yourself. So we thank you for it now, Father. Father, we pray that your love and your grace will, will grow in the hearts and minds of these, your people. Father, those voids and those empty spaces that, that should have been filled with the love of a father, a love of a mother. Father, we pray that you will take us up you will fill us up. You will fill these, your people up, that the love of God will fill every spot within them. Bless us now as we leave this place and not your presence. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Those of you that have been joining us, be, that you have stayed with us um, on social media, thank you very much. And we'll see you again next week. <laughs>